It's my pleasure to introduce Kendra Dare. She is an assistant registrar with the museum program. She is the one who cu curated our beautiful Paxson exhibit that's out in the lobby, and I think she did a great job with it. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what she learned in that process. She is a native of Illinois. She's been here at the Historical Society for five years. Um, I think of her as one of the new kids, but she's, she's still a kid even though she's not that new. Um, she, before here, she came here, she was in um, California at the Far West Historical Association, and before that she was in Andersonville, Georgia at um, a National Historic Site. So. Um, I will give you Kendra to tell us about Edgar Paxson. Well, as Kirby mentioned, um, this was the first exhibit that I did curate here at the Historical Society. And I felt really fortunate to be able to do so. Um, I was involved in pretty much every aspect of it, from picking out the pieces in the very beginning to helping with the installation and design and layout of the whole exhibit. So it was a really wonderful experience. And I hope you enjoy this illustrated slideshow of the exhibit. And also, I wanted to mention, too, that we have a book in the museum store too on Paxson. So if you're interested, that is available for you to purchase at the end as well. So with that said, I'll just jump right in. Edgar Paxson was born April 25th, 1852 in East Hamburg, New York. His early education was at Webster's Corners, now called Orchard Park, New York. There he met his future wife, Laura Millicent Johnson. He then studied at the Friends Institute known today as Friends Seminary. Paxson, much like his contemporary Charles Russell, received no formal training. And he's quoted in the Anaconda Standard as saying, It has been my constant thought and desire during my leisure hours to study painting and thus be prepared to show others through scenes as I have observed them. Nature had provided me with some artistic ability, but the training and mastering of colors were only to be a course of study. I was never so fortunate as to be in a position where I could even acquire the rudiments of art. At the age of nine, he became an apprentice to a scenic painter who designed and painted backgrounds, stage wings, and curtains for theater productions. He later took an apprenticeship with his father, a carriage builder, painting fancy scroll work on carriages. The skills he learned during both apprenticeships aided his ability to make a living in Montana, first in Deer Lodge between about 1878 and 1880, and then later in Butte from 1880 to about 1906. Paxson's wife, Laura, and their three-year-old son, Lauren, arrived in Montana with Robert, Edgar's brother, in the spring of 1878. They traveled by the Union Pacific Railroad from New York to Ogden, Utah, then by stage to Deer Lodge. In a short time, Laura had made herself and her family at home in a house Edgar had rented in preparation for their arrival. It was in Deer Lodge where Paxson found that he could make a living as a sign painter. However, it was still kind of difficult to make a living there, and in 1880, he moved his family to Butte, where he continued sign painting. In addition to sign painting, however, he also developed a relationship with theater producer John McGuire. And this is just, this is a photograph of their home in Deer Lodge. Paxson painted theater sets in Butte's Renshaw Hall, and it was printed in the Butte Daily Miner on March 28, 1892. The hard finish has been put on the stage front in Renshaw's Hall. Mr. Paxson has already painted a fine kitchen scene. He is now at work on a wood scene, after which he will commence on a chamber interior. McGuire also managed theaters in other towns, such as Phillipsburg and here in Helena. Paxson followed McGuire to these towns, and he painted theater backdrops there. The theater backdrops painted for the historic opera house in Phillipsburg still remain today. And this is just a slide showing what the Phillipsburg opera house looks like today. You can see both the exterior and interior of the house. And um, some of the theater backdrops that still remain today are ones like this, titled The Palace, Dark Woods, Light Woods, and sky. In July of 1885, McGuire's Grand Opera House in Butte had its opening night. 
performance, and Edgar was provided with his own studio in that theater building. But unfortunately, on July 24th, 1888, a flame flared up, and it ignited many of the stage backdrops and materials in the theater. And within a matter of hours, the theater burnt to the ground. And during that fire, Edgar lost everything in his studio, his tools and his artist supplies, um, everything was gone. Fortunately, another theater was built in 1889, but um, after that, Edgar and McGuire had a falling out and their relationship pretty much ceased at that point. During the same time, Paxson also contributed several drawings to magazines such as American Field and Outdoor Life. He even illustrated books for books such as By the Order of Profit and um, The Life of Statler. In the exhibit, which hopefully you'll have a little time afterwards to walk through there, um, we have some examples of the illustrations from The Life of Statler, and I'm going to go through a few of those just so you can learn a little bit about them. Um, this book just contains incidents and antidotes, um, images of Methodist history that um, Hack Paxson illustrated. In this first slide, um, there's Wearing Out the Winter, and this Im image illustrates the harsh conditions endured by Reverend and Mrs. Statler, who were suffering with hunger and cold when they arrived in Denver without any money to their name. The next one, Getting a Supply of Meat, illustrates a story about Reverend Statler, which recounts about him shooting a deer that had taken up with their cattle. Scare at Custer Hill. In this image, Paxson illustrates the 1876 battle on Little Bighorn. Although the battle took place 12 years after the Bridger Group passed through the area, the author still devotes several pages to the future event. And it's not surprising that Paxson chose to illustrate it because at this time he was considered an expert on the battle. So it's pretty obvious that he would um, choose to illustrate it. And his epic 1899 painting, um, Custer's Last Stand, is in the collection of the Buffalo Bill Historical Society. And you can see what that looks like. I've put a picture of that in the slide. And then also down below is a photograph of him in his studio working on that piece. The One Horse Preacher. This recounts the story behind a Methodist preacher and an Episcopalian bishop who came across each other on the trail. And the bishop called out to the Methodist preacher, oh, you rich Methodist parson in your two-horse buggy, to which the Methodist reply, perhaps you are a one-horse preacher. <laughs> and, um, like I said before, these illustrations are all on loan to us, but um, in going through the exhibit and pulling out pieces for it, I came across this untitled piece down below, which is a preliminary sketch for the illustration, which I thought was really kind of neat. So you can kind of see um, what it looked like in the very beginning stages and then how it kind of evolved once he was finished. And then um, pack train crossing the mountains. In 1886, Statlers and several other families decided to go on west to Oregon. They traveled in two horse wagons, cooked their meals by campfire, and slept on the ground. The route crossed through very densely wooded areas. And on this trip, the party met no one except a pack train coming from Walla Walla. So as I mentioned before, he also illustrated for magazines such as American Field and Outdoor Life. And what's interesting to note about the drawing on the right over here is that it's actually signed Pistol Grip. And this was a pen name that Paxson used a lot of times when he was illustrating different pieces for magazines such as American Field. And while the following images here are from American Field, I have an entry that I came across from Paxson's 1901 journal that states, Friday, October 11, 1901. I came home and put in the day at steady work. About 3 p.m., Mr. J.A. McGuire of Denver, Colorado, and the editor of Outdoor Life made me a call. I enjoyed the visit very much. He wished me to finish him some illustra illustrated articles. I gave him one I had already prepared, Beaver Dick. I wished him to stay longer, but his time being limited to his regret, he could not do so. 
So in 1898, the Spanish-American War erupted and interrupted Paxson's career. And at the age of 46, he volunteered for service along with his 17-year-old son, Harry, and his brother, Robert. Paxson joined the Montana National Guard on April 28, 1898 at Butte, Montana. He was given the rank of first lieutenant and attached to Company G. His brother, Robert, and his son, Harry, also enlisted at the same time. Edgar was 46 years old, he was married, and a father of four, so he probably wouldn't have been expected to enlist, but um, he went anyway because he held soldiers in high esteem and he felt that it was his duty to do so, and so he did. And in this photograph, uh, it uh, is an image of Company G Montanans from Butte, and his son Harry is actually in this photograph. So he is the f in the fourth row from the bottom, and he's the fourth one over in the fourth row. So maybe you can kind of find him up there. Um, in the diary of Samuel McCutcheon Shields, who was also a part of Company G of the 1st Montana Infantry, he wrote on July 18, 1898, we're off. At 8.15, we struck camp and took our way in heavy marching order to the Pacific Mail Dock. We had a four mile walk to ship. It was no snap with 70 pounds to carry. One poor devil in our company took two extra blankets, an overcoat, and a lot of books. The captain advised him not to take so much, but he insisted. Lieutenant Paxson took pity on him and allowed him to give his gun to a kid to carry. And the next couple of slides just show the ship Pennsylvania, which is what Paxson traveled on. <coughs> the Butte contingent went to Helena to join units from around the state, then on to San Francisco, where the first Montana volunteers were mustered into Army. The sea voyage left Edgar, who did not suffer from seasickness, quite a bit of time to draw scenes on board the ship. The ship stopped at Honolulu where Paxson did some sightseeing and drew some more sketches. And then it was on to Kavite across the bay from Manila where they were informed that the Spanish-American War had ended. <laughs> and again in uh, Samuel McCutcheon Shields' diary he writes on August 24, 1898, at four this morning, could see the lighthouse at the entrance of the bay, our passing Dewey's battleground, and can see the mass of some of the sunken Spanish vessels. The health officer has come on board and is inspecting our ship. He says an armistice has been declared. War is probably over. The, con the conditions at Kavite, however, were less than desirable when they got there, mostly in due to insects, the hot weather, um, there was illness such as dysentery, skin infection, and malaria. And Lieutenant Paxson was assigned to stay with the men to supervise and inspect them. His duties include, the duties included were to unload and store cargo from the ship in the bay. By the end of the first week though, Paxson also had signs of malaria. He had become so ill that he admitted himself to the hospital and the doctors recommended that he take a two month leave and head back to the United States. But Paxson would not go because he felt that it was his duty to stay with his troops until they went home. But he finally decided to apply for sick leave and um, it, it was against his moral principles but he felt that that was best to do and so he was assigned a room in the hospital to wait for transportation back to the United States. But while there he continued to draw um, different scenes that he saw while he was there. And the following slides illustrate some of the works that he did while he was over there. This slide, um, this drawing in particular, he writes at the bottom, note here in February 1898, Spaniards decoyed a number of insurgents, fired on them, killing several. One was captured. He was stood up on the stone in front and shot full of bullets and fell into the grave the previous day the stone marks his resting place. In one of our excursions, we camped here and lunched. Two Spanish soldiers came, thin, ragged and gaunt, out of brush and fed out of our meat cans. We gave them what we had left. And in this next slide, you'll just see that he's documented some of the sunken and wrecked ships um, while over there. The view on top is of Marie Constantine and then below Belasco. 
So he sketched much of what he saw, like I mentioned. Um, several of his works depict scenes such as this and also different buildings in the area. He also depicted some of the work that the natives did while they were there too. Uh, this particular one he um, indicates in pencil, which you probably can't see in the slide, but um, he indicates where the Navy Yard is in the background. He also points out the different colors of the buildings, um, what they're made of, which is really kind of interesting, I think. It kind of gives you a better idea of what he saw when he was over there. And he also writes that this view is the south entrance to Kavite. So he kind of gives you a bit of a perspective and so you know what you're looking at. Uh, in this drawing, he indicates where the quarters for Company G are located. Uh, he also show, um, points out several buildings in the background that have been par partly demolished. And he labels different landmarks, such as the mountain in the background, um, and that um, this is, again, the north end of Kavite. And written near, in between his wording, north end Kavite, around which Dewey made his entrance, right below that, he has penciled in that um, this is the point around which Dewey came to do this after breakfast work. To do what, I'm not sure, but I don't know if he never finished that or what, but it's kind of interesting to note. And then in this drawing, he writes at the bottom, near wall, woman laying clothes on grass, little girl busy, native fishing, magnolia trees, walls very dark and gray, little collage, red tile roof. The wall San Juan has two shot holes inside toward bay. And this is a drawing of a monastery in Manila. And again, he comments at the bottom, this marks the line of trenches occupied by 10th Pennsylvania Battery, behind which was the first California volunteer, to the right front near road. Holmes was shot. He no doubt held his position long enough to pre prevent the right of his regiment, Pennsylvania, from being flanked. The building shows the hot fire which they were receiving. So finally, when Paxton was able to head home on his ship, he was actually struck by a wave which threw him against a spar and he encountered more injuries and um, on top of his sickness and that he was having problems with while he was already there. Um, and this drawing just depicts some of the people that were on board with him. So um, it's just, again, it's a nice way to see um, you know, who some of his companions were while he was on board the ship. And this is a photograph of Paxson um, on the left. He's the one wearing the hat. Um, it shows him sitting on board the ship as he's headed home. And um, the other one depicts him at home. He's actually um, next to his wife there who's standing in the background and then um, also is his eldest son Lauren and then Bob who is his youngest son who are also pictured in the photograph. When he finally did return home he was commissioned by the Butte citizens to design an ornate archway and sculpt a statue of peace to stand on top of it welcoming home the volunteers in 1899. And again, in his 1901 journal, he writes, July 20th, 1901, spent a short time in town tonight. The arch is a fine sight lit up with its many electric lights and the Chinese lantern, lantern hung along the streets. Remind me of night in Japan. Paxson's dedication to his country and high esteem for other soldiers carried on later into his life. When World War I began, he wrote to the War Department and volunteered to drill recruits in Missoula. And this photograph shows him parading with his charges, um, some of who are high school students and others um, that are university students. So we've seen so far that um, throughout his career, he's painted signs, stage backdrops, he's illustrated books and magazines, and he also 
created many portraits, some of which were of friends and family, many of which were of Indians. And some of his portraits depict great historic figures, such as Chief Joseph. And there are a couple images here showing him at different stages in his life. And Black Hawk and Two Moons as well. Paxton developed a unique relationship with Indians, and he was considered a friend, earning him the name Katlosi, which means he sees everything. He was able to converse with many of them through sign language and eventually in their own language. And to aid in his understanding of difficult languages and dialects, he created his own dictionary. And it was interesting talking with the family because they do still have um, some of the pages of that dictionary left. So I, it would be really fascinating to see that. Um, Paxson's daughter described an early memory of her father in his studio at work, and she states, Indians came often to visit or sit silently, watching the artist at work. At about the age of five or six, I remember being called in and having to sit in the lap of perhaps some famous Indian chief. He was friendly with the Indians and became interested in painting pictures of them to help preserve their history and customs for the future. They were always welcome in his studio. And this is just a photograph of him in his studio working on a painting. This painting, The Latest Arrivals, is in our collection here at the Society. And his daughter also recounts um, a memory of it as well. She states, I was called in to pose for a part in a picture. It was very tiresome to stand still for more than 10 seconds, so I thought. This instance I particularly remember was my brother Bob and I posing for the picture, The Latest Arrivals. And you'll notice there's another, again, another preliminary sketch off to the right. And I, I don't know if this is true, but I kind of suspect that that could possibly be um, his daughter and son maybe posing for the two in the image. I'm not sure, but it seems plausible. And then I'm just going to go through a few of his portraits. Um, some of these, I think, are probably some of his better ones. So I'll just kind of run through those so you can get an idea of some of the portraits that he created. And many of these, again, are on exhibit, too. So hopefully you'll have a chance to view them. But this is a watercolor uh, titled Crow. Um, this is an untitled piece, also a watercolor from 1915. Assiniboine Indian, 1908. Bannock Indian, uh, watercolor again from 1917. This is an untitled piece, also a watercolor from 1916. This piece is titled Squaw by Roadside, um, and it is an oil on canvas board dated at 1900. Charlot, oil on board, 1917. This is a graphite on paper piece of an untitled Indian dated 1911. And then I uh, threw in this piece of his father, titled My Father, which um, is dated 1894. And then, again, this watercolor titled Canadian Cree Trapper from 1905. We, again, have the sketch for it, um, which has the title Figure on Snowshoes with Gun. And then... <coughs> Uh, again, this oil on paperboard is untitled as well, but dated 1899. So in addition to that, he was also commissioned to create detailed architectural drawings for Butte's Irish American Club. And you'll see, I have a couple of slides here that um, show some of the detailed drawings that he created for the billiards room at the... Irish American Club, which are the first two here. And then these two were to be for the reception room at the Irish American Club. In 1906, Edgar and Laura could no longer stand living in Butte. It had become very polluted and noisy. And so because of Laura's health, they decided that they would relocate 
to Missoula. And this is the photograph of their home in Missoula on Stephen Street, which is actually still there today. The Paxons, once they relocated to Missoula, they immediately realized that they had made the right decision. Laura's health improved, and Edgar found good hunting and fishing within walking distance of their new home. He immediately set to work remodeling the house and turning an outbuilding on the property into his new studio. And with the addition of a fireplace, the new building provided a studio and gallery comfortable for him to work in year round. During the last years of his life, Paxson completed two of what probably can be considered his greatest artistic achievements, six historical murals for the state capitol building and eight for the Missoula County Courthouse. The Missoula County Courthouse was designed by A.J. Gibson and it was open to the public in the summer of 1910. However, according to press reports, the public outcry erupted in 1912 over the historically inaccurate and inept interior decorations. The Women's Club of Missoula, largely through the efforts of um, a Mrs. Pound, raised about $1,000 to hire Paxson to replace the original decorations with more appropriate paintings. Paxson consented to the job in December of 1912 and right away he began reading and studying and deciding on what subject matters he would present. The actual painting took Paxson 16 months, and like the murals in the state capitol, he worked exclusively out of his studio on the murals for the courthouse and completed them in July of 1914. And here are a couple of more murals from the courthouse. Paxson began on the murals for the state capitol in 1911. He, Ralph DeCamp, and Charles Russell had been selected to do the work for the just completed wings of the capitol building. Edgar was commissioned to paint two 4 by 12 foot panels and four 4 by foot panels depicting historic Montana scenes of his choice to be placed in the foyer of the chamber of the House of Representatives. And when he was given the go-ahead by the Board of Examiners, he plunged into an exhausting full year of pain, all again which was done out of his studio. And so these are the murals found over in the Capitol. And we also have these on the flipper screens, which are the little video monitors out in the exhibit too. So in 1867, 